Hello everybody, I'm Tanya Mormon. You are watching In The Flow. And today I have a very special guest. I will be interviewing Salandia Hammond. There's so much to learn. And that's what we're bringing you. Stay tuned. Hello, my name is Monisha Epps and I am the owner of Day to Live and Adult Daycare Facility. And the facility is about getting seniors out of being home and just being stuck at home all day. So it's a place for them to come and interact with peers of themselves. We take anyone from the ages of 18 and older, and we also take someone who has Alzheimer's, dementia, and they don't actually have to have a mental or health issue, they still can come to the facility. At the facility, we assist them with activities of daily living that includes things like bingo, arts and craft, painting, different things that we can do that can keep them busy. We have two locations. We have one in King Street and we have one in Florence, which is one of our newer locations. We are located on 500 Pamphlet Highway, Suite G, and my contact number is 843-206-9042, or you can contact me via email at dailylivingllc at yahoo.com. And we'll be here to take care of your loved ones during the day while you're away. Hello, I'm Reverend Terry Alexander, asking you to join me every morning at 7 o'clock a.m. with Prayer Time with Terry. God is always willing to give, but we are so slow to ask. We must be intentional in our asking of God. Again, join me every morning at 7 o'clock a.m. with Prayer Time with Terry. Start your day with prayer. Are you in search of residential or commercial services like cleaning, moving, landscaping? Book us at we'reallone.com or dial 843-206-7550. I am Zalandia Hammond, a.k.a. Sue Hell Baby, and you're watching In The Flow. Zalandia Hammond. Miss Tanya, girl. You're in the flow. <laughs> Thank you, man. You know, when you're in the flow, you're in the know. Yes, definitely. And I had to, uh, we had to have you on because you're someone who is very important to community, very important to arts in the community, but you do so many things. Mm -hmm. You do a whole lot of things, but what I want people to do is get like an in-depth interview and understand who Sue Ham is. So tell us, who is Solandia Hammond? Well, for, for starters, I'm someone who's still uh, finding herself and creating herself. And that's the great thing about living, man. You get to continue to uh, explore and create and um, become anew. But as for right now, some of the things that I totally identify with is I'm a mother of three beautiful children. I have an awesome grandson that just whew, works my nerves, but I love them all the same. <laughs> you got any grandkids yet? I don't, not yet. You'll see, man. They totally replace your kids. But nonetheless, <laughs> uh, an author, a writer, um, actor and a speaker, community activist, and I'm also a councilwoman. Yes. See, you have so many jobs. You really do. I, I thought I had a lot of jobs, but you made me realize I, maybe I don't work quite enough. No, you do. You do. <laughs> okay. I want to ask you, you, you talked about some of the things that you do, mm -hmm. um, the hats that you wear, that you're a mother, but tell me a bit about your childhood. Well, I grew up in uh, the rural parts of Williamsburg County where, you know, I always say there was nothing but trees, trees and more trees. The country. The country. But it afforded me an opportunity to use my imagination. Uh, one, of the, one of the quotes that I like about Einstein, he said, imagination is everything. It's the preview of life's coming attraction. So for me, I was able to read a lot and use my imagination and just, you know, explore in the woods and just think about the things that I wanted to do and the places that I wanted to go. Um, I have five siblings, so it's a big family, six of us, six kids in the house, two parents. Um, so it's always a lot of love, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of comedy, a lot of God, and a lot of education. So it was a great upbringing. And I grew up around family where my grandmother was right across the road, you know, I mean, right across from us. And then uh, my great aunts right across the road where we could go and borrow a cup of sugar, you know, right. borrow some lard, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And um, even to the point where if one of our electricity went out, we'd, we'd, we'd stretch out a drop cord to the other person's house. You wow. see what I'm saying? That's how I grew up. And then in the summer times, I would spend a lot of time um, in Morrisville. Uh, where I stayed with my grandparents and they had an outhouse, you know what I'm saying? No indoor plumbing. And so 
Um, I understand what it is to do a lot with a little. I understand what it is to come from humble beginnings. I understand what it is to have family and to have family that loves you so much and fills you with so much to the point where you don't even feel like you're without. Right. So that's the kind of uh, uh, upbringing I came up in, working in the cucumber fields, um, having family that, that really harps on education, really harps on love and kindness and harps on God and excellence. Well, so. I, I see that. I see that in your works. I, I hear that in the conversations that you have, um, things that you share with people, mm. not just in your works. Sometimes because we, we watch you online, you <laughs> you have a, a nice social media presence you. and you share a lot of information with people. Um, so that comes from your background. Oh, yeah. Tell me a little bit more about your parents specifically. I'm a father, Vietnam veteran. Um, the thing about my father is, you know, he was a genius. Unfortunately, he died at 56 from colon cancer. But prior to that, my father, I want to say, I believe was the first one to finish college. He got an associate's degree. Um, he was one of the first black supervisors at AMBAC International, which is a company that manufactures airplanes, parts for airplanes wow. in uh, Colombia. And, you know, he was the first person we seen wearing a beeper, you know, because back in them days you had a beeper, you were important <laughs> or you were doing something you had no business doing. Um, and luckily for him, he was important. Uh, but my father was really big on education. Um, he traveled the world from being in the Army. He retired as a first sergeant from the Army Reserves. And his whole thing was, if you're going to do something, you be the best that you can be at it. And so my father put excellence in our heads from, I mean, and discipline and cleanliness from the ground up. And then there's my mom, who's that family oriented person, uh, come from a family of 12 brothers and sisters and was all about love and kindness, was all about God and comedy. If you want to know where we get the comedic skills from, and you would, you would never really know it because my mom was so quiet, but we get it from her side of the family. I mean, they're just hilarious. So comedy, love, kindness, family, and God, that all came from my mom. Um, I've never seen this lady hurt anybody. I've never seen her talk ill of anybody. Um, I've just, I never saw my parents smoke, drink, cuss, none of that stuff. It's just, it's crazy. You <laughs> mean with 12 kids, nobody was smoking? <laughs> no, no. Wow. So, you know, I had a good upbringing. I mean, it was, it was, you know, when you look back, you're like, whoa, we didn't have the best of best. We were sharing clothes. We would go to the yard sales and we were, you know, buying clothes for 25 cents. We were sharing clothes. Of course, I was buying books, you know, because I love to read. But I mean, we were excited. We we didn't have a laundry machine. We didn't have, a, you know, dryer washers. We had to put our clothes in big hefty bags. And you're talking about a family of eight, six kids, two parents. And you're talking about we were carrying like six, eight bags to the laundromat to wash and dry every freaking Saturday. So. <laughs> and see, and, and you know what? <laughs> That taught you a lot. It and, did. And when you think about some of the things, if we come current day mm -hmm. and you look at some of the things that we're going through now, mm -hmm. um, we're looking at the economy now, people really don't know how to live. They don't have some of those survivor skills. Correct. They don't have those make do skills. Correct. You know, you so know. I, I I'm going to get it out the mud. <laughs> That's what my parents taught us. We get it out the mud. No excuses. Okay. Well, talk to me a little bit about your your education and, and take me even to, to elementary school. What was that like oh, in man. King Street? That was amazing because all my life I wanted to be an actor, right? So for me, uh, going to Cade Stephen Elementary, that was like my first stage because you're talking about a school with a bunch of kids. So and here I am, want to be a comedian and an actor. Yo, no better time than the present to try out my skills. So it was amazing growing up in the rural area. It's like everybody was family. Um, parents understood that teachers got on your case. Okay, it's all good. Don't come back here telling me, you know, Miss Cooper or Miss Williamson or Miss Gamble got on your case because you needed it. You know, it, it wasn't one of those things where the parents were combative with the teachers. They were in alignment with the teachers in raising you. Right. So that was a great thing about growing up in a um, small community with a small school. Uh, then transferring over to King Street Senior High, man, I thought, I was like, whoa, this is what New York City must be like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're talking about going to a high school with um, close to a thousand people. And it's just like, everybody was just different. And I was like, wow, the lingo was different. And I'm thankful for that experience. 
because I realized that the world, even though I knew that through books, but I got to actually physically experience it by going to this school, uh, the world is bigger than where you grow up. Right. And a lot of times, you know, we imprison ourselves because of our environment. But the way to escape that is through travel or through reading or or through the storytelling of other people. And that, that, that in and of itself will inspire you to want to travel and experience different um, cultures and diversity. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But... I just want to go back a little bit, mm -hmm. just just a little bit. So you said in elementary school that you knew that you wanted to be an actress. Oh, yeah. And I'm listening to your background. I hear where you came from. How? How did you know you wanted to be an actress and, and why? I guess it's like Michael Jackson. He always knew he wanted to perform. I knew like at the age of five, even before being in school that, I mean, I would just like, I'm the type where I would just try to steal the show. You know, everybody sitting in the living room talking and I'm trying to do something like, look at me, look at, and my grandson is the same way. Oh my <laughs> God. I told his mom, I'm so sorry. It's in the jeans. But, um, and it was just something about me that I could pull people's attention. It wasn't like, oh, let's just look because she's a child. It was like they were really captivated. And then it went into dancing contests because I love to dance. Um, I started dancing. I started reciting poetry, started doing monologues. And there was something about, I guess, the way I delivered things that actually got people's attention. And for me, being on stage, oh, my God, that's like life to me. You know, uh, if I'm dying, put me on stage. If I'm dying, put a mic in my hand, you know, <laughs> because that gives me life. I feel like that's what I was born to do. And I'm, I'm blessed to have been one of those persons to know that at an early age and not have to go through two and three, four and five, six different things to figure out what is my purpose. You know, I know that my purpose is uh, reaching people through my voice, through my writing, through my acting and uh, through what I do. Okay. So for where you are now, mm -hmm. what would you consider one of the, the turning points in your life to bring you to present day? Uh, moving back home. Um, I moved, I got out of the military in 2001 and I moved back home in 2003 and my father passed in 2006. And if you've never witnessed someone take their last breath, let me tell you, it will do something for you. I realized that we're not our bodies at that point because I was actually able to see my father take his last breath and then his body still lay in a hospital in Seattle, Washington. And I was like, wow, just like that. We come into this world, we go out of this world, we leave this body. And I was just like, man, he's 56 years old. I didn't, I never saw that coming. And that's, that's, that's relatively very, young. It's very young, very young. And I was like, I never saw that coming. And I was just like, man, he's, he's so brilliant. He has so much more to do, but apparently not, you know? And I was just like, wow, I got to rock this life out. Everything that I want to do, I'm going to attempt to do it. Whether I do it scared or whether I do it full of confidence, I'm going to attempt to do it because I don't know when my, when's my last day. And I don't want to be laying in a hospital bed filled with regret. You know what I'm saying? Right. I want, I, and I don't want people uh, at my funeral saying, man, she had so much more to do or she could have done this. I want them to say, sue him, baby, rock this life <laughs> out. Yo, she wanted to be a pilot. She's taking flying lessons. She wanted to write. She started writing. She wanted to act. She started acting. She wanted to teach and reach the community. She started doing it. Whatever this woman said that she wanted to do, she attempted it. Whether she fell flat on her face, face or she got up and she soared, she did it. And that was the thing is she 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 became who she said she wanted to become. She did what she wanted to do and she had what she wanted to have. And so, um, yeah, my father uh, dying at such a young age, that was a big turning point for me. And I realized, you know what, uh, I, I don't like saying this. We're not here for a long time. Because I believe that you speak those things onto yourself. And I want to live to 120 years old. I don't know why that number. Stop. I'm sorry. <laughs> Stop. Because you just took my number. Wow. I tell people all the time. Wow. That my intention is to wow, live. Wow, I got goosebumps. To 120 years That's old. That's my number. Yes. That's so my number. We share a number so wow. maybe we can celebrate each other's birthday. Come on, somebody. All right. But let me, let me just say, I'm not going to let you skateboard. <laughs> past the fact that you were in the military, but we're going mm -hmm. to take a break. And then you're going to come back and tell me about your military experience. Oh, man. Okay. Sure thing. You are watching In The Flow, and we'll be right back with Zalandia Hammond. We got more work to do. All right? Stay busy. Well, you made so hard every time. Do you want to come back as well? <laughs> this is where you need to be. You need it. Come get it. You put me in work. This is the good life, baby.
and we're back. We're gonna get a little bit more information <laughs> on you being in the military because out of everything that you do, <laughs> I was not expecting you to say that you were in the military. Mm -hmm. Talk Marine to me. veteran, man. Marine, the best one there is, okay? Make no uh, mistake about it. Uh, but yeah, I. Um, you know what sent me into the Marine Corps? No, I can't imagine. Fear. <laughs> and that, that's so funny, right? Because people were like, you should have been afraid to go into the Marine Corps. Absolutely. I was afraid to actually pursue my dreams, man, of uh, being an actor. And so for me, the Marine Corps was my plan B. Cause I was like, yo, if I gotta have a plan B, I gotta make it seem like, you know, big, astronomical. And of course I love the uniforms and I love the fact that people say, hey, it's a challenge and you probably not gonna make it and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, okay, I'll show you I will. And so I joined the Marine Corps and it was like one of the most amazing things in my life. I did um, almost nine years, met so many different people. And it's great because when you come from a county that is about 70, 75% African American, right? And it's great when you get to go somewhere and you get to see Asian, you get to see Indian, you get to see Egyptians, you get to see uh, Caucasians and you, you work together and you don't care that someone may have come from this social class or this uh, economic class or this educational background. All you know is that you have a mission, a goal, and you're supposed to work together to accomplish that. And that's what happens. And so I'm very thankful for that opportunity to realize that my world is bigger than what I see in front of me or what the media portrays. Because a lot of times the media portrays and they program you with this negative stuff and it'll have you thinking that the entire world is comprised of evil people. And that's, right. that is so not the case. The world is bigger than that. The world is better than that. It's, it's bigger than that. Yes. And it's smaller than that. That is so true. Now that is very true. And so... Being into the military, all I did was take my discipline up to another level because my father instilled discipline in us like crazy. But being able to work again with men and women that were working for one mission, you know, one team, it showed me how to move. And it also showed me how to eliminate excuses because in the Marine Corps, you know, we had the saying, do or die. Right. So there's no in between. I mean, either you're going to do it or you're going to die. And so I, I embraced that mindset even though a lot of people think we're crazy because of it but I embraced that mindset when it came to accomplishing my goals or it came to defeating challenges or obstacles that were in the way and uh, I loved it I lived in Iwakuni Japan for almost four years wow yeah my middle child was born in Iwakuni Japan and uh, I had both my kids there I loved it well, let me ask you this mm -hmm. how were you being in the military how were you able to maintain the artist how did you continue That's to hold crazy. on to that dream <laughs> that is crazy um i pretty much was letting it go but it's so funny how the world is how well let me take that back how the spirit is, how God is. It doesn't matter how much you try to fight something that's in you. If it's in you, it's going to come out of you, right? right? And it's so funny because friends and stuff would have like talent shows or little monologue competitions and things of that nature. And they're like, Sue, we think you'll be good for that. And they never knew my background now. Mm -hmm. And they're like, Sue, we think you'd be good for that. And I'm like, okay, yeah, all right. And I would do it. And so it's like every time I thought I was getting away from it because I felt, you know, I'm from a small area. You know, me having these big dreams and wanting to be in Hollywood or even create stuff like this is never going to happen. Every time I tried to get away from that, it was always something pulling me in or someone. So it was either I was in a play. Like I had a gentleman say, hey, Sue, I think you'd be great in a play. I was like, wow, you don't even know this, man. This is what I want to do. I want to, you know, and I'm like, really? And, you know, I get lead roles and things of that nature. So it's crazy. But a lot of opportunity came to me while in the military. And, interesting. Uh, very Interesting. Very interesting. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. And, okay, who really inspired you? Because you knew at such an early age mm -hmm. that you wanted to be an actress, but was there any actor or any film in particular that inspired you to really want to get into acting? Uh, three people. Uh, and before the acting, it was just the entertainment aspect of it. Because I consider myself an entertainer. Um, Michael Jackson. I love the impact that he had on people, boy, girl, man, female, didn't matter what culture you were from, you were falling out, you right. were passing out. I wanted to marry <laughs> Michael Jackson. <laughs> well, my name was Salandia Jackson. Uh, you know, my, my last child's name is Jackson. Wow. <laughs> You're Jackson. I'm a Jack. 
<laughs> Listen, I practiced writing my name, Tanya Jackson. As my mom. Young. So the fact that I actually yeah. have that signature for real is just really crazy to me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, my mom, uh, my mom, I think on the um, on the album I have, his Thriller album, it says Solandia Jackson. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. So you're taking too many of my things. You I wanna, know, man. You want to live 120 years like me, so we're going to be here together. Oh, can we do this old? We'll have an old lady show. That'd be cool. You know, we're, we're, yeah. Yeah, we'll flash back to now, 2022. So sure. save this footage. Yeah. Save this footage yeah. and we'll, we'll have some behind the scenes or cool. something. Cool. Wow. Okay. We'll still be fly. But yeah, Michael Jackson, Cicely Tyson, and of course Whoopi Goldberg. Oh. When I seen the movie um, Color Purple and Seely in that movie, to me, depicted, of who I, depicted who I look like. And it was like, oh, I'm seeing somebody that looks like me on TV. Mm -hmm. You know, real life. The hair not fixed. You know, but she's acting. Right. And people love this movie. I love this movie. And so that really did something for me. And I'm really hoping that um, I get to meet uh, Whoopi Goldberg this lifetime. Oh. I really do. Yes. If you yeah. do, invite me. Yeah, absolutely, invite man. Invite me because, I mean, I'm bald head now, <laughs> but she really was an inspiration for me to grow my dreadlocks. Mm. Like when I saw her, well, she and Bob Marley, mm -hmm. but when I saw her with her hair just unapologetically growing out of it, her head yes, the way man. that it was, I was like, you know what? I can do that because yeah. before her, I'd only seen Bob Marley with dreadlocks, mm -hmm. and so when I saw Whoopi Goldberg as a woman, and to be you know, mainstream, mainstream, yeah. she, she did everything that she she's wanted. And she to wanted to do. do unapologetically said what she wanted to say, and I still and she's still saying it. Yes, I love her to this day. Yes, she, if if she hadn't become a part of the View, I probably wouldn't. It wouldn't even be on my radar at all right now. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to you know, come back to you, mm -hmm. because we want to talk about you. Um, what, or, or should I say, um, when did you know that there was something, or let me, let me think about this. Mm -hmm. You were in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. You said you came back home. So when did you know that you could pursue some of your artistic and entertainment endeavors? When did you know that? When the fire in my belly became so strong to the point where it was really consuming me. It's all I thought about. And um, I remember having this breakdown and I was upset because um, there weren't any opportunities at the time. You know, 2006, there weren't 2007, 2008, there weren't any opportunities in a rural area where I'm from. Um, I didn't want to go to Atlanta at the time. I didn't want to go to New York. I didn't want to go to Cali. And plus, I mean, you got a lot of competition. But um, I had this breakdown, and I was just frustrated, and I was just like, i never forget, I was on the floor crying, snot bubbles, everything, and I'm just like, God, why did you give me this talent um, if I can't use it? You know, mm. like, freaking take it away. I mean, take this desire away from me if you're not going to provide an avenue for me to freaking use it. That was your conversation with God. Yeah, I, and that's how I talked to God. You know, it's not, oh, father, oh, mother, please. No, I, I'm, I'm a realist. And I talked to God like that. And I'll never forget the thought that came to my head, which for me was God, was like, I gave you the talent. It's up to you to do something with it. Woo, girl. <laughs> I got up off the floor and I said, oof, my God. And then I was like, okay, the opportunity is not here. We're all creators. I just realized it. I'm a creator. Let's create this opportunity. Mm -hmm. Pulled out the Word document and started typing. Didn't know the format for any scripts or anything, but I just knew I wanted to uh, produce a stage play. Didn't know any producers or anything of that nature. Didn't know anything about building a set, but I was like, hey, the only way to learn is to play. And so I got in and I just started doing, and we did our first play in 2008. Uh, we had just a wall put up <laughs> as our set, you know, one little wall, and we rented furniture from um, at the time, I think it was Renner Center. Mm -hmm. And um, most of my family were the members in my cast, wow. you know, and boom, we went from there. And the thing about it is we got in the game. But see, here's the thing about it. They say, um, when you know better, you should do better. I always say, no, they say, when you know better, you do better. I said, no, when you know better, you should do better. Right. But not everybody does. And I was like, for me, in order to get better, I need to study. And of course, you know, there's no social media at the time, so I didn't have any Facebook groups to go in and learn 
So when different plays came to the area, and when I say area, I mean like an hour and a half, two hours out. Right. You know, I would go and sit in that audience and I would learn just from being an audience member. Okay, they did this. They said it like this. Okay, he turned this way. Okay, I didn't know anything about it. stage left, stage right. All I know is he came on the stage, <laughs> you know. And um, and I was looking at like, wow, when they go to intermission, they're usually leaving you at a cliffhanger. And then when you come back from intermission, we want to solve that, you know. And I'm just like, man, the really great plays, they're not just comical all the way through. They have substance. You know, they're comical. Um, they get you upset. You know, they make you think about someone that you lost. You know, they, they give a message, but they don't hit too hard on the message to the way you feel like, oh, my God, this is so heavily message oriented. And it's, you know, I was studying and, and watching and and then the only other thing for me to do was to come and execute. I'm always thinking about my audience and I think that part comes to me from Michael Jackson because he always thought about his audience and how they would feel. How will they see it from this angle? You know, how will they feel when they hear this word? What if the word is said this way? What if the music is played this way? How will that impact them? You know, that transcend them in time to a time when they lost, you know, their loved one or will that make them feel happy when they first had their firstborn? And I'm thinking about those things as I'm writing, even though I'm letting the spirit filter the words through me as I'm writing, I'm also seeing and, and envisioning how the audience is going to get this, receive this, react to this. And it's just like, wow. And you know, uh, I just feel like if you put yourself in the position of the audience member, I'm even to the point where I'm thinking, are they cold? Are they hot? You know, I want them, I want them to have the best experience of their lives because I, again, I go back to the Michael Jackson era when you, when I've never been fortunate to be in one of his concerts. But when I watched it on TV and I see those people, I'm like, I want people to feel that way when they leave us to him entertainment production. Well, I will tell you this because um, I've actually sat in a Sue Ham production. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll, I'll share this. I, I know you won't mind if, if I just no. share this truth. But I remember seeing online, I can't remember what year it was, but I think it was the play... Uh, was it salon drama? Might have been. Okay. Might, or either flipping the script, the earlier version of it. Okay, one of those plays, but I do remember seeing that you were having the play, and I'm like, wow, somebody in King Street having uh, a play? Salon drama, yeah, you came into the behind the scenes for us. Right, but what my interest was, mm -hmm. you know, I was like, okay, well, King Street, I'm like... <laughs> What do they know about putting on plays? And I'm like, who, who is this? I'm like, all right, you know what? I want to support this sister. She looks like she has a lot of en energy. But let me go see this little country ass. <laughs> Serious. Oh, what kind of play again? This little country ass play. <laughs> so, because you know that's how people support us. They're like, oh, right. I got your little job. but So I'm, I'm half ass supporting it. I'm like, I'm going to support this sister. I want to see this. But, but let me go see this little country play. Mm -hmm. And so I get there and I, and I see that you had a community behind you. Mm -hmm. You had a family behind you. So I'm like, wow. Okay, well, let, let's see what's going on. And I get in there and I am just floored. Wow. So everything that, that wow. you told me that you were paying attention to, mm -hmm. you know, to learn how to do this, I would have never known that you wow. were not classically trained because I was like, whoa, she knows what she's doing. And I left there just amazed. Amazed. That's our first time meeting. I remember the community beat. The I think that was the beat. That was the name of the show. Oh, man, I was so <laughs> excited that you came and did a whole segment on us. And ever since then, we've been connected. That was uh, 2015. Right. Seven years later. Seven years. Yeah. In your opinion, what makes art like such a powerful medium? Ooh. People get to see themselves in somebody else. That, and I got goosebumps. That's that, it. Yeah. <laughs> You get to see yourself in someone else because, and I'll take this for example, whenever I was going through bad relationships and I would try to get uh, my significant other to see what I was saying, my point of view. Let's watch this movie. <laughs> Let's watch this movie. Let's, you see that scene right there? And then they would understand because it's like, that's you. That's me. Because apparently my communication skills aren't working, but art gets to show you who you really are or who you can become. I like that, you know, and that's why the arts matter, because when I'm watching something and I'm like, oh, my God, 
they went through hell, you know, times three, but yet they persevered and boom, now they just whoo, riding on the cloud. It's just, it's amazing at what art does to somebody, whether it's poetry, whether it's a, a photograph, whether it's film, whether it's stage, whether it's music. It has the power to just do something in you, man. Like you can hear a song or even food, you yes. know? You can taste something and it can take you back to your childhood or mm -hmm. take you back to a moment in time where you experience something with someone, you know? You can hear something, a song, and just remember, you know? And that's why I tell people, you gotta be cautious of what you, what you look at and what you hear. Yes. Because why would you want to listen to something that's going to take you to a moment in time wherein it was an ugly, dark part of your life? Why would you, you know, let that go. Let it go. But the art, I mean, it's, the arts matter. And they it, do. It, it, it changes the world. So what are some of your, what are some of your desires for the artist community here? Um, be authentic grow, invest in yourself. I, I say that all the time. We talk about that. Invest in yourselves, you know, and I get it. Um, I was the same way too. Hey, give me some money. Give me some money. Invest in me. I'm doing this. But people are more prone to invest in you if you show them that they should invest in you. You know, when you show them that you can do a lot with a little, when you show them that you are faithful, when you show them that you are constantly learning, hey, I'm learning this class. Hey, how can I come serve you? How can I come on your set? I want to be a host like Miss Tanya. Okay, go to Miss Tanya and say, Miss Tanya, how can I help you? Instead of Miss Tanya, put me on. Show me. No, 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 no. Bring an offering. Yes. Miss Tanya, how can I carry the camera for you? Can I carry the bags for you? Prime example, a friend of mine, uh, he wanted to get into videography, right? I want to, you know what? <laughs> uh -huh. I want to stop you right there uh -huh. because you're piquing my interest. You really are. I'm going to put you guys on a little cliffhanger. Stay tuned and we'll be right back with a little more of In The Flow. TV and you're watching In The Flow. Hey guys, I just want to remind you, the last Sunday of the month, make sure you tuned in to the Brown South Girls. It'll be myself and KJ, and we're here to bring you all Brown Girl contents because our lives matter. We've got something for you. Solandia Hammond, you're In The Flow. Thank you, man. You know, when you're In The Flow, you're In The Know. And we're back. You're watching In The Flow. And I'm here with Solandia Hammond, playwright. She does so much in entertainment here in South Carolina. I want to take the people right back where we were before break. And you were talking about people wanting someone else to put them on. And, and I know what that's like because people will ask me, Miss Tanya, what kind of camera you use? You mm -hmm. were talking about them asking about videography, but go ahead and finish talking about that point. Yeah, I have a friend of mine, uh, and it's so crazy. He wanted to like just jump straight into getting behind the camera. And the company that hired him was like, nah, you're going to work your way up to that. What you're going to do is stand here and guard the gear. <laughs> and for him, he was like, I didn't sign up for this. You know, I, I want to get behind the camera. I want to see what you guys are doing. Da, da, da. But he had to work his way up to that. And I think a lot of times people want to jump in at the top. Right. And they don't realize you got to get in at the bottom, baby, and work your way up to that. Serve your way up to that. And a lot of times people don't want to waste time on people who aren't serious. So when you say, Miss Tanya or Sue Ham, can you show me this? And you come one time and I've dedicated three, four hours to you and I never see you again. You know, I'm going to be bothered. But if you come to me and you say, hey, Miss Sue Ham, or and I'm sure, hey, Miss Tanya, what can I do to help you? How can I come every two hours, um, you know, every Saturday for every two hours to help you? And in that helping, what you're doing is getting a free education. Right. And I think that's what people are missing is that, you, you know, interning, that, that's, that's a beautiful thing. Absolutely. Um, I have driven hours to go sit at the foot of somebody to say, hey, how can I help you just to learn? You know, what are they doing behind the scenes? How can I tighten up my show? You just, know, just to be on the set, just to be on the to, set, to, to get that view of all of the working parts. Absolutely. How is this thing working? Absolutely. You did it for us. I mean, I think it was like a 10, 12 hour day. Where we were shooting behind the scenes and uh, you were there and I was just like, wow. And a lot of people were like, I'm not doing that. I'm not getting paid. But you are getting paid. 
just not in a monetary value. Right. But that knowledge that you're getting, nobody can take that from you. You can lose money. It comes and goes. But that knowledge of how to do something, you can use that to acquire money over and over and over again. You know, and that's one of the things I love about this show, In the Flow is you, you give artists, you give people an opportunity to share their stories. And I always feel like there should be more things like this on TV, on social media, where we can hear how people started, how they got it out the mud, or if they didn't get it out the mud, you know, where they got it from and where they took it to, you know, how'd you move the stakes? And I feel like if we have more things like that, we can inspire um, and hopefully compel people to want to do things and go higher. Because I love these kind of things. I love the master classes. I love the one-on-one -on -one interviews. And so I'm thankful for this show. And I'm yeah. thankful uh, for the guests that you have on this show. Because we need to see that. We need to know, listen, if they can do it, dang on it, I can do it too. What are your thoughts on how you connect like your art life and your business life? Mm -hmm. Because you do have a business and you're also... Um, a councilwoman. Mm -hmm. So what is that connection? Uh, creativity. Because uh, I think that in this life, in order to continue to thrive and in order to continue, I don't like to say survive, I think that we're supposed to be thriving, man. Uh, it takes creativity and it takes the ability to shift. Mm -hmm. It also takes the ability to work with others. It also takes the ability to see things that people can't see. Right. You know, um, that's how inventions are made. Um, I believe that's that's how we manifest things. And so I think um, being artsy and being a creative, it gives me an edge. It also gives me the ability to pivot, you know, because a lot of times people that only see one way or have a one track mind, they run into a wall and they're like, oops, that's it. Can't go any further. I'm like, I'm going to tear the wall down or either I'm going to pivot and go around the wall, you know. So I think be, being an artist that gives me that ability, it also gives me the ability to connect with people and to feel them and to um, have empathy. Right. Um, because I feel like a lot of politicians are um, out of pocket. They um, they don't understand what the average person is going through, mm -hmm. you know, and don't get it twisted. I love nice things. Even when I was a child reading about nice things, I always said, I'm going to have nice things. I'm going to travel the world first class and experience nice things. But at the end of the day, I do also understand what it's like to struggle. And um, that's one of the reasons why I took on the role as an educator, because um, I know what it's like to not have anything but want it. I know what it's like to to want to know how to get to the next level but not have that knowledge readily available. And so as I, I was like, you know, I pride myself on one of those persons that once I get it, oh, it's over because I'm going to tell the world. Right. And so I pride myself on telling people and, and sharing the principles, the strategies, the tips, the concepts. And then I also pride myself on hopefully inspiring people to execute because knowing how to do something is one part, but being able and willing to execute it is a different thing. And so I also try to inspire people and to get them to execute. And I feel like once I've done that and you still are stuck in the seat of mediocrity and comfort, then there's not much more I can do because now it's an inside job. You know, it's always an inside job. Right. But what I'm saying is if I extended my hand to you and you don't reach out, there's not much more I can do. You got to be willing to do something as well. Okay. So. Well, I mean, throughout time, and it'll always continue to be this, this type of pattern. Mm -hmm. Arts, artists are kind of, they couple with politicians because mm -hmm. that is what community is anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But very few times have I actually seen artists who are <laughs> actual politicians, mm -hmm. how, how do the people in the county and how do the people within the council look at you or accept you as a person who is in politics and who actually sits on the council mm -hmm. and still know you as an artist in the community? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I, I, I would hope. Well, one of the things is that I have a pulse with the people, the community, and no matter what, um, I think that the poli being a politician is just an extended arm of that. So I'm thinking that the people don't really see me any differently. Um, I think more people come to me now because they figure I'm in a position to be able to do more. Um, but when it comes to the people that I see sit with, I don't think they see me in a negative light or anything of that nature. I think that they know that when they come to me, though, they got to come accurately. Um, they gotta, they gotta, yo, because I'm going to look at both sides and I'm going to look at, you know, what's really going on. And for me, it's not about getting re reelected. For me, it's about what's best 
for the masses. So when you come to me, understand that whatever I vote or whatever I say, it's not going to be a political thing uh, because I'm looking to get reelected. I'm, act I'm actually looking to get the people taken care of. And so I think that's a big difference between me and a lot of politicians. Mm -hmm. um, I don't care if I'm a career politician. That's not an aspiration of mine. What my aspiration is, is that while I am in office, that I am of the best service I can be to the people. And for me, what I try to get the people to understand is you have the power, not the politician. The people have the power. And when you guys can really understand that and come together as one, you can make anything happen regardless of who's in office. So, um, you know, so I think that when my peers see me, they understand that and they understand that, look, okay, we got to be legit. Um, we already know, you know, Sue's a voice. She, she gonna let the people know what's the truth and what's not the truth. And, um, that's not going to change just because I have a position or a title. You know, you had a video that went viral. <laughs> Sue Ham was beat on the way to church. Yes. On, on the way, way to church. church. You decided to hit a beatbox. Sure did. Why Sue? I was in the shower before church. And I was in there beatboxing. And I've always beatboxed ever since I was a kid. Now, I'm not good, but I love the fat boys. And I've always beatboxed. And I was in the shower on the way to church, and I was beatboxing. And I'm telling you, I was like, I'm going to do a video of me beatboxing before I go to church. <laughs> now, you listen, if you're a comedian, you got to understand, we think differently, right? Because sometimes I'm like, Lord, why are you giving me the thoughts that you give me? Because I'm like, people are going to think I'm crazy. And... um but I think differently as comedians, things that I shouldn't laugh at, I'm laughing at and things that I should cry about. I'm laughing at. So I'm like, OK, I'm going to do it. <laughs> you did it. I did it. And um, I put it up. Nothing happened. A year later, this thing's go. It goes viral. Sean Kingston shared it. It went viral. It made it to world star hip hop. And believe it or not, that opened up the door for me to be able to talk to the Steve Harvey show. <laughs> something as you know I don't want to say silly but just silly, in a, silly. In, a, in a fun way it was not silly. silly in a derogatory way but just yeah. something just like really silly light hearted yeah. you know and fun <laughs> and a year later so can you still beatbox a girl barely but I can you know again I was never that great but it just goes to show you, you know, I was consistent with it though that just goes to show you that uh, I think it was Kevin Coolidge that said uh, most talented people are not successful because they lack the consistency and the discipline to pursue their craft. And, you know, I'm paraphrasing Ooh. it. So that, that's why you see people who are average do phenomenal things because they're consistent. But you see a lot of people, oh, I can rap, but what are you doing to be better? Uh, what do you know? I can write, well, what do you do? You know, but then you get somebody who's every day like da 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 da. And then before you know it, it's like, boom, the world knows them. But yeah, anyhow, I beatbox, okay. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. Look, I don't, I don't want to wet up the floor in here now. Special, special in the flow big box for the people. Yeah. That's you know. what's up. I, I like that, that you're able to have fun. You're able to laugh at yourself. Oh, yeah. Because, like I said, you do so many serious things in the mm -hmm. community. Um, and I'm glad you said that because a lot of people think that if you're a politician, you're stoic and you're just this person who doesn't have fun, who can't relate. Right. And I wanted to change the face of that because I'm, and I told the people when I was running for office, I'm not that person. You know my background. Go look at my videos. I'm not changing who I am. I'm bringing my thoughts, my ideas, my processes and who I am authentically to that office if you elect me. <laughs> yeah, and I'm glad. I mean, yeah. King Street is definitely lucky to have you let me pronounce it right because you know we, we country yeah. we call it really and i know i probably said it a few times already i call it king street but no really, tea on the end but it's not no no it's tea. king street yeah king street king street so y'all get that right yeah all right i want to ask you a little bit about um your plays or mm -hmm. have, have you been writing lately where where are you at with the production of your plays Man, I tell you, I pivoted into back into real estate because a lot of people don't know I did real estate before. Um, I pivoted back into another the, hat. Yeah, <laughs> and I love it. Uh, when COVID hit, it kind of shut things down. As you know, we were going strong with the productions. We were in Wilmington, North Carolina. Matter of fact, you were mm -hmm. there with us. Uh, so um, you know, Sumter, South Carolina, King Street. And then when COVID hit, it kind of shut things down. And so I was like, wow. So like so many other people, I pivoted and I went back into real estate investing and uh, finding my specialty is finding old houses and rehabbing them. 
and um, either selling them, but I really like holding them and placing tenants inside and refinancing and taking the equity out and going and doing another property. Um, so for me, that was like doing a production because I'm taking, you know, nothing and creating something. Absolutely. And then uh, the audience, which is the family, moves in and they love it, you mm -hmm. know. So um, that's where we were. And in the process, I was still writing some plays. And um, like I saw your producer here, there I do have some plays that are unwritten because I, you know, it's like spur of the moment. I get a thought, I write it and I leave that and then I'll go, oh, I want to do this one. I'll do that. But um, we've got about six, seven plays in the can. Wow. In the books that has not even been produced. Because one of the things that um, Maurice pushes me to do is new productions. Instead of doing the same production over and over again, he challenged me. He said, you're going to write new productions and you're going to do new stuff every time you do something. Unless someone requests, you know, one of your previous plays. I'm like, man, you know how much work that is? He's like... <laughs> like, you're right, but but you said Maurice. Yeah. And uh, tell people who Maurice is because they don't know. Maurice is my significant other. Um, I was going to say my baby daddy, but I don't like saying that. He's uh, We have a son together, Jackson. But Maurice is also my producing partner, my best friend. Um, he's like my heir. You guys so, work yeah, he's so my heir. well together. Yeah. yeah. I owe a lot of my success to him. Um, he pushes me out of my comfort zone. People are like Sue, how how did, you know you you're just you're just eccentric. You'll never be in your comfort zone. No, I do get in a comfort zone sometimes. We're human. We all do. Right. But he never allows me to rest there. You know. So um, he's like, you're gonna challenge yourself. You're gonna do three productions a year, and they're gonna be brand new productions that you're going to write. And I'm like, dude, how you going to tell me what I'm going to do? And you're not the one writing. No, but you can do it because you're capable of doing it. You're very talented. And I mean, he's just, it's not one of those things. You just do it. He's just telling me like, you're talented. You're gifted. This is what you're born to do. The way that you impact people. And I'm like, okay, you're making yeah. me feel good. And then I go, so then I go, stop trying to gas me up. He's like, I'm not gassing you up. He's like, you are just that great and you're going to do it. And the people are waiting for what you have. Of all of the plays that you've done oh, so far, man. that's the question that people want to know, Sue. I mean, I don't make this stuff up. Oh man, they want me to ask you, what's one of your favorites? Ah, I hate that question. Every one of my babies, it's like you have children and they're like, you got a favorite one, mm -hmm. and secretly you might have a favorite. <laughs> You might not, not saying that's me, kids, but you <laughs> might have a favorite one, but you would never let anybody hear you say that. Mm -hmm. I, that's how I feel right now. But um, I love all my babies just the same. Mm -hmm. But I would have to say two of them come to mind. Um, Beautiful Minds, uh, which is the last one that we did in King Street um, about, uh, actually, the last time we performed it was in Sumter, uh, about bullying. Very and impactful. Um, yeah, accepting who you are and, and, and forgiveness and whatnot. That one was very impactful, and it was very impactful because the majority of our actors were high school teenagers. Right. Uh, and for most of them, they had never acted before. And so that was really deep because of the message, but also the people who were able to convey the message. Some of them had been bullied. Some of them were in their schools who were not being seen or didn't have a voice. And um, because of that play, they were now being seen they now had a voice. They were now an inspiration to adults and children who had been bullied. And, and that's what that's what's crazy to me is that we had adults coming out saying, you really have no idea how impactful that play was for me. Uh, we had people calling and emailing and inboxing and saying, I didn't know my child was being bullied, but they had the courage to tell me after watching your play. Wow. So, you know, when you, when you, that play had, and again, Maurice called it. He said, that's going to be your biggest play today, to date. He said, that play is going to transform lives. And I was like, man, whatever, man. And he's like, I'm telling you, watch what I tell you. And that was the hardest one for me to write. So hmm. if I had to pick one, it would be Beautiful Minds. Um, and a, a close second would be Rise Up. Um, the one that we did in Wilmington. Right. Oh, my God. Rise Up won. The one in Wilmington, it was so magical. It was unbelievable. And, you know, it's a great thing to be able to go somewhere where people don't know you. Mm-hmm. And to still be able to touch the audience. Right. And so for me, that's an indicator for me. A lot of people want to just shine in their own backyard, in their own pond. But for me, I what I like to see is, can I take this and replicate that magic somewhere else? Okay, we, you know, we could sit here and we could, we could talk 
for a long time, you know, and, and I love talking to you, but there's there's three specific questions that I got to make sure that I ask you. And uh, one mm-hmm. of them is, what would you suggest a young black person who has the same ambitions as yourself, what should they do to get into this industry? One is believe in yourself because you're going to have the world um, telling you that you're not enough. But if you believe in yourself, you're enough. Secondly is um, get a mentor. Uh, find somebody in the community that's doing what you're doing. And if you can't find that somebody, that's the beauty of the Internet right now and social media. Lock into these Facebook groups. Lock into somebody that's on social media. Study them and what they're doing. Because, again, I had to learn from just going to different plays and sitting in the audience and watching. Mm-hmm. Um, but nowadays it's so much easier to learn between YouTube, Google, and and um, Facebook. There's somebody that you can find. Okay. And um, thirdly, um, just don't give up. Don't take no for an answer. Be consistently always looking for that information and lend yourself to be of service to other people. Because you, And get out and socialize and tell people what you do and what you need help with because you'd be surprised at who is connected to who. Mm-hmm. You know, whether you're going to a meetup in person or whether you're doing a meetup on social media. Tell people what it is that you do because when I was... Um, needing help with certain things and social media did come along, I would say, hey, I'm looking for this. Or does anyone know how to do this? And a lot of times people keep their mouths closed and you don't get fed that way. Right. So you got to ask for help. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, we talked about some of your stage plays and what you had coming up next, but um, do you have any film projects mm-hmm. that you have in the works so that you have interested in doing? Yeah, man. Um, the South Carolina Arts Commission gave us a grant to do um, a short film called King and King Street. And um, what I'm doing is making it like a narrative, uh, detailing some of the live events of when Dr. King actually came and spoke to 5,000 people in King Street, South Carolina. I remember um, that. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that. I didn't know it until I was in my 30s, which is crazy. I'm reading about Dr. King, but no one knew to tell me that he was in my town. Come on, man. Mm-hmm. So um, we want to use that film for three different reasons. One is to inform, let people know. Two is to inspire. Uh, hopefully get the wheels turning to let people know, hey, Dr. King came here. King Street, Winsburg County got to be special. So uh, listen, let's, let's embrace that. And number three, for people to take pride in who they are. And to understand that we play a pivotal part in history and to get involved in politics, get involved in education, get involved in community, um, because we are the ones. You don't need a, I've always said this. You don't need a position. You don't need a title to effect change. Absolutely. You can effect change without any of that. So um, we're hoping that that's what this film will do. Okay. Well... That, that's really good because, you know, you, you've got to have a pride, not only a pride for yourself and for your ideas, but also from where you're from. Yes. From where you're from. Yes. Let me ask you this last question. All here. right. <clears throat> okay. Let me ask you this last question. Mm-hmm. What are some of your thoughts on collaborative work? Some of the collaborative works like the script club. I know that you're you're interested in a part of of that organization talk about that i think it's an amazing thing uh collabo is amazing when you collaborating collaborating with the right people Uh, (laughs) you know there's a difference between um i'm just trying to think of the right way to say it i guess i'm at a point in my life where i want to separate mentorship and collaboration And what I mean by that is where I'm the mentor and I'm teaching someone, right? Right. Yeah, I can learn from anybody. But typically when you're mentoring someone, you're pretty much the one shoving out all of the... You're uh, carrying the load. Right, absolutely. But when you're talking about like the script club, you're talking about a bunch of creatives coming together, bringing great experiences, things that you may not have the answer to, that you can now be like, you can lock arms with your brothers and sisters and be like, okay, whoo, teach me what I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, or help me take this idea to a different level because you see it from a different perspective. And so I think that collaboration is amazing. And I think that it's needed more so in these rural areas because, you know, when you got one person one hour away, another person two hours away, you sometimes feel like a person on an island by yourself. And that can become very overwhelming. But for me, I think that it also can limit your creativity. Because when you can get into the room, think about why the great shows are so great. They have writer's rooms. Right. 
You know, you got people in here that are bouncing ideas or taking your idea to another level. And so I think that when you get something as amazing as the uh, script club into existence and you've got different writers and people come from different background, you have no choice but to be catapulted to a new level. And I'm excited about that. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to being a part of that and bringing what I know. And I'm also looking, I'm excited about being ignorant for once, you know, because, uh, I get to learn now. We get to learn. Yeah. And so, um, I'm acknowledging my ignorance on a lot of things. Therefore, because I acknowledge it now, I can fix that problem and I get to learn and I'm open to receive because if I come in thinking I know everything, I won't learn anything. You're right. So yeah. and it, it is very, it's very exciting because mm -hmm. unlike being in industry towns, like you say, some of us live an hour away, two hours away or whatever, the case may be, um, just to be able to have a group mm -hmm. that can come together mm -hmm. and who've made that collaborative effort, that's a wonderful thing. So and a synergy, man. It is. You, need, you, you know how important that is for us because mm -hmm. it's easy to be in a place, well, I won't say easy, but I would imagine it is... You know, it feels good to be in the industry where you can meet up at a yeah. coffee shop with a bunch of different artists and writers and, you know, just kind of uh, brainstorm and kick ideas around. You can do that in big cities mm -hmm. where there's an industry. But what what the script club will offer to, to a place like this, to smaller towns, and, and anybody who wants mm -hmm. to have a writer's club or whatever they want to call it, you need to do that because mm -hmm. it's important. We need to be among each other yeah helping each other absolutely and i'm looking forward to it because i think you know it again it goes back to creating what is non-existent you know a lot of people think you got to move to this city to get it why don't you create it in your city absolutely <laughs> well you have created a lot mm -hmm. in a small town for your city for our city and that's why we wanted to have you in the flow and you've been a wonderful guest. Thank you. I hope we'll get to talk to you again. Man, as many times as you want. <laughs> all right, I'm holding you to it. All right. I want to thank you all for watching In The Flow. We're going to continue to bring artists, community, business leaders, politicians, and all of the information that you need to know. You can get it right here, In The Flow. <laughs>